this is Valley Pit, the Safari Cave Pit Podcast. Personal Computer Division was a toxic environment. I had taken a prototype that we had been working over to the Research Division because I was going to show uh, Alan Kay. And I come back uh, with the unit, and I'm being threatened with arrest. Michael Jackson spent a couple of days at our facility in Campbell to help us with the digitization of things like Beat It, talking to the Tremeals. Sam was pretty rational. His brother was insane, and the old man was just an asshole. I'm Kevin Savitz, and this is an interview episode of Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. Tim McGinnis was a hardware design engineer in Atari's personal computer division in 1980 and 1981, then moved on to become senior research engineer slash assistant director of corporate research engineering through 1982. Tim was co-developer of the 400, 800, and 1200 XL computers and peripheral products. He was also the initial architect and designer of the first version of the Amiga computer. He left Atari in 1982 to co-found Romox, a software publisher that had a unique software distribution system where you could load new software onto cartridges using an in-store kiosk. This interview took place on May 23, 2015. So, uh, where should we start? How did you get started at Atari? It was a relatively strange thing. Um, I had come back to the United States in the fall of 78. been living and working overseas for several years. Mm-hmm. Um, actually engaged in a fairly strange practice of selling computers outside the United States. See, in, in the early 70s, actually throughout most of the 70s, it was uh, computers were a heavily regulated and restricted product goes height of the Cold War, uh, coming right out of the Vietnam era, etc. So literally you could not buy a mainframe computer uh, from the United States to be, sh- to be exported. Uh, Europe solved this problem by making their own, although the European countries were, were allowed, they were considered you know, uh, uh, permitted countries. Germany, France, England, etc. But they also had heavy computer manufacturing uh, capabilities within their countries. So in the case of Latin America, you couldn't buy one. However, the the loophole was uh, that American companies would set up their own facilities in these Latin American countries, and you would truck in your your work. They'd do their punch cards, they'd process it, and they'd give you back the green bar reports. They wouldn't even give you the punch cards back. Hmm. So um, I discovered that there was an exemption to this process, and that is used machines. Um, so what we did is we sort of bought used computers in the U.S. We threw them in a container, uh, unassembled, brought them down to Latin America in our base in Costa Rica, and reassembled them, refurbished them, assembled them for our clients, installed, maintained them, did all of that good stuff. So we were the first computer company. Uh, selling computers in certainly in, from Colombia to um, to Guatemala. Anyway, so I came back in '78 when the whole region started to fall apart when Nicaragua fell to the communists, and went to work in the area of in circuit test systems. In other words, computers that tested other computers. Okay, did that for a while. Um, consulted with some interesting people developing radar systems, and uh, I helped design the first uh, truly small boat computer navigation system. This is in, like, 79. Um, Atari had a kind of a weird uh, search going on. They were looking for a hardware engineer to help them develop the home computer product line but they needed somebody who had experience with designing for testability. Mm-hmm. So because I had about a year's worth of experience in designing uh, test systems, I uh, applied for the job, 
got the job and and found myself as one of four hardware engineers in the uh, what was then called the personal systems uh, division. Um, working for a extraordinarily challenging manager, vice president, by the name of Gene Rosen, who ran the place like he was, um, you know, I won't say Adolf Hitler, but he certainly was a dictatorial manager. But then again, um, in hindsight, I do understand some of the challenges that existed because we were one of the few rational engineering departments, perhaps the only rational engineering department in the entire company. Um, when I joined the company, we were located off of, um, I think it was uh, Boragas, um, and that was the building where um, Steve Jobs had worked out of and um, and some other notables. Mm-hmm. One of the engineers that I worked with was a guy by the name of Michael Truppiano, a uh, very gifted hardware engineer. Uh, we moved into another much vaster building, um, address escapes me at the moment. But we did some pretty amazing things. I mean, my areas of responsibility were, you know, making sure that we could get our designs into manufacturing, but I also worked on the design of uh, uh, our floppy disk drives, helped write some of the the disk operating system code for, Mm -hmm. uh, for those as well. Took us through two generations of uh, floppy designs. Um, And, worked on a multitude of little tiny projects, including the world's first uh, home banking project that was designed for uh, chemical bank customers. Hmm. This was based upon a um, an acoustic coupler modem. I think, it, I think the brand was called CAT. Hmm. Um, it was a... If I remember correctly, it was less than 300 baud. Not K baud, but baud. Right. <laughs> In other words, 300 characters a second maximum throughput. Right. Um, but the reality is, is that in order to make it work, um, and we actually were dead on, uh, we built in hardware security into this thing, so it didn't matter whether it was intercepted. There was encryption in the modem itself that hand that handshaked with. Uh, the modem on the opposite end, so there was nothing in the clear in between the two devices. <laughs> um, unfortunately, a lesson that wasn't learned in the early days of the web, but it was a successful prototype, but it was a little too early in the market for such <laughs> things. <laughs> so about a year later, um, a man by the name of Alan Kay was hired by the company from Xerox Park. Alan was a research engineer over at Xerox, and he became the uh, chief scientist for the company. Um, We had a variety of research groups within the company. We had uh, the engineering teams in the personal computer division, in the arcade game division, and in the the game console division, plus Mm -hmm. a couple of others. We had one up in Grass Valley. We had uh, Northern California up above Sacramento. Uh, known as cyan, like the color cyan, Mm C-Y-A-N. Then we had, of course, the semiconductor research group that was just down the street from us and uh, a couple of other loose groups that were just sort of running amok. The arcade group was the most extreme um, (laughs) because it came out in the late 70s as sort of the god kings of the company for a while and you know, they were the ones that had the hot tubs in their engineering departments, etc. By the time I had come into the company, the company was beginning to make a a bit of a right turn towards mm-hmm. a being a little more conservative. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that, you know, Nolan was was gone and Ray Kassar, the sock man, was now in charge of the company. And he really had no freaking idea what was going on or um he was a he was a manager's manager kind of a guy. Mm-hmm. And truth is, the company needed it. They needed it desperately because we were up to seventeen thousand employees at that point in time. And mm-hmm. you know, we had 
um, about 120 buildings just in the Silicon Valley area alone by the end of 81. So uh, about mid-81, I transferred over to Alan K. Alan Kay's group to became assistant director of corporate research engineering. Mm-hmm. And that was a little bit like putting me in a toy store <laughs> where I had a vast budget and no real um, responsibilities other than just create cool stuff. Mm-hmm. So Sounds like a fun time. There were, there were several parallel groups under Alan. Um, so for example, um, you had people that were brought in from Xerox to focus on more academic pursuits. Um, uh, Brenda Laurel, for example, was, um, researching and beginning to develop the, the science of interfaces. Um, we had, uh, junior engineer that, that worked for me, uh, with me. Um, one of the projects that we were involved in was the development of a token ring network based upon the Atari using the serial port. So we actually had a functioning network of Atari computers in late 81. Um, and so, actually, yeah, I've, heard of, I've heard about that, but nobody, I didn't know, have any details, even that it was token ring. So that's, well, cool. it was it was token ring like token ring. I mean, basically, it was using the concept of of tokens being passed in a ring like fashion. In order to maintain the network, you had to have a ring of computers. Uh, it could be any number from two up to a maximum, I would believe, of eight. Um, the target was the educational environment, um, and the the first application that was developed was a multi-user game um, where each machine showed the uh, the positions of each player that were running from their own individual computer mm-hmm. um, and that position data was being passed by the serial port um, from computer to computer. Cool. And um, we did other things. So for example, uh, one day I had come in from work and I had an exercise bicycle at home and I thought how freaking boring that is. So I decided I had done some some hardware work on the Battlezone game previously and I decided, wouldn't it be fun if instead of just using the the hand controllers in Battlezone, if we could tie the speed that you moved instead of being you know, an analog position of the hand controllers, that it was based upon how fast you pedaled. So basically took a simple magnetic sensor, wired it into the battle zone logic, um, used um, instead of, of analog position for the hand controllers, we just simply used forwards and backwards on the, uh, uh, on the handlebars Mm-hmm. So you sat on this thing, and you could control um, the forward or reverse direction on each of the two treads using the handlebars, but your speed over the landscape was controlled by your pedaling forwards or backwards. Mm-hmm. In order to back up, you actually had to pedal backwards. <laughs> and I think once we got the logic working, I probably spent the better part of about four days, about five hours a day doing nothing but pedaling. Uh, because it was an incredibly addictive game. And true tragedy that we never succeeded in taking it to market. Wow. Um, Because ironically, when I left the company, um, the CEO, it was presented to the CEO of the company, and he didn't get it, and he wouldn't wouldn't, uh, approve the project to go into production. Uh, This is one of the things that was happening with Ray Kassar is that he was sitting in on far too many of the product and engineering decision meetings that were taking place in the company. He was not an engineer. He was a financial manager that come from the Burlington Sock Company. Right, right. Not the Burlington Coat Company because that's just a retailer, but the industry that actually spun 
fabrics and socks. Why Warner Communication in their in their divine wisdom chose him to be in charge of Atari was beyond reckoning. And he was single handedly responsible for the death of the company. Because he couldn't grasp the necessity for innovation and as a result believed that the little stupid black boxes would just continue to sell mm-hmm. until they literally hit the wall by selling one to everybody on the planet who wanted to buy one and those sales just stopped in in eighty three. And as a result I had worked on a uh, a 5200 model based upon my work on the, the 1200, the 1200 XL, and the 1400 series personal computers, but they weren't ready to go into manufacturing at the point where it hit the wall. And the other thing is, is that the company had so many millions, I mean about $400 million in inventory out in the channel that was just unsellable. Mm-hmm. That's the real reason that they buried the ET games. The real reason that they buried them mm-hmm. is they needed to liquidate and and make disappear inventory off of their books as fast as they possibly could as one of their gambits to survive. Mm-hmm. See, if they if they'd have simply liquidated it and sold it at discount, mm-hmm. um, they wouldn't have been able to do what they did with the ET game, which was to claim that it was defective and just bury it. Right. But there were a variety of financial reasons why they did what they did. It wasn't just that the game was crap, um, and it was crap. I mean, there were some outstanding games being produced at that point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, I left the company in, in mid, well, late 82, to help found a company called Romox, because there was a profound problem in those days and, and again, I'm I'm sort of jumping around, and I'll come back to Atari in a moment. But there was a profound problem in those days in that most software was being sold on cartridges, mm-hmm. and the cost of manufacturing a cartridge was exorbitant in those days. Um, so it was a real inhibitor towards software innovation because you had to have a game, and then you had to physically manufacture that cartridge. Not like today where you could create a piece of software, one person in their underwear right. and throw it up on the web the web and it would download. There wasn't even any download capabilities in those days. Our sure. company our company invented that process as well. So we invented a cartridge that was fundamentally reprogrammable and we developed the the infrastructure necessary for end to end distribution of not only these reprogrammable cartridges, but also software key kiosks that were deployed in places like Sears and Toys R Us and 7-Elevens that a customer could walk up to, buy a game on the kiosk, download it onto one of the reprogrammable cartridges in a couple of minutes, Mm -hmm. and then walk away with it. And when they got tired of it, as they inevitably would, Mm -hmm. they could drop it in a slot, it would be erased, and they could reprogram it. That's awesome. Um, so it was somewhat revolutionary at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we certainly had a multitude of competitors, but we were the only company that actually deployed. Um, even Nolan Bushnell decided that he was going to copy what we were doing, and he created a company called Kuma Technology. Failed miserably, absorbed a huge amount of venture capital, but never developed a working system. Um, we did. So anyway, going back to uh, corporate research days. So we focused on a multitude of of things. Uh, My projects included the first consumer robotic product. Um, We developed a little robotic arm that interfaced with the Atari computer. There was a company out in Arizona that made one, but it certainly wasn't suitable for mass production or for the average consumer. Mm -hmm. So... They had a great idea, uh, very poor implementation, uh, very costly. So we developed one that was uh, essentially could have been sold for about $200. Uh, You know, remember in those days, 
products were relatively expensive. The the base Atari 800 with 16K of memory was a $1,200 computer. Interestingly enough, the cost of a leading-edge computer hasn't really changed in 30 years. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the yeah. leading edge computers are always right in around that twelve hundred dollar price point, and then they drop, of course, from there. But then the next leading edge one comes in at about that same price point, whether it's a Surface Pro or whether it's an Ultrabook or, or you know, a Mac Air or whatever it may happen to be. That's about the the mean price point of sort of the entry level models in each generation of computers that have come along. Somewhat ironically, although, you know, certainly what $1,200 was in $1980 is quite different than it is today. Right. That's the right. equivalent of about $10,000 today. Right. The number remains the same, even though the the money is worth less and the computers are way more powerful. <laughs> exactly, which is, yeah. which is astounding when you think about it that Atari was selling the equivalent of a ten thousand dollar computer in nineteen in nineteen eighty. That's a pretty astounding fact, given that it was being sold in Sears and Toys R Us, and it was su- selling successfully. It it was it it was an astounding period. Um, so anyway, um, so in Atari in the personal computer division, it was a relatively straightforward set of activities. We were primarily focused on uh, taking the Atari 400 and 800 through three generations, although the public wasn't aware of that. Um, But under the hood, they went through their generations. Um, You know, the, the, the evolution of the graphics chip was the most notable uh, external factor of those generations. Then beginning to work on the the twelve hundred. You mean the the, the, CT, the CTIA to the GTA? Is that what you're referring to? Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, um, quickly, my time was consumed by developing the the twelve hundred model, uh, which actually when it went into production was the twelve hundred XL. I still have in my collection a, a twelve hundred, not an XL version. Mm-hmm. Hard the only problem with them is the uh, is the uh, the floppy drive that I designed. Mm-hmm. Um, the twelve hundred version, the limited production versions, uh, didn't have sufficient shielding, so you have to lo- use aluminum foil on the outside of it. Otherwise, you get read errors. Hmm. Good to know. Uh, yeah, um, so I still have one of those, and still works after after thirty five years. Nice. Uh, we built to last in those days. Yeah. And um, and then moving on to the the fourteen hundred with the concept of the integrated floppy drive in the base console. Right. Um, Were you involved in the, some, with the fourteen hundred and the fourteen fifty? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I was one of the the three principal engineers on both of those two projects. Oh, excellent. Um, although I I abandoned it uh, when I went to corporate research. And left it in the hands of of Michael and and other engineers. Mm-hmm. Um, personal computer division was a toxic environment. Uh, so much so much pressure from Gene Rosen and the president of that division. Um, you know, I I, re, I remember an event where I had taken a prototype that we had been working over to the research division because I was going to show uh, Alan Kay. Mm-hmm. And I come back uh, with the unit and I'm being threatened with arrest because Gene Rosen was having a conniption fit that I had taken it out of the office over to another Atari office mm-hmm. to show another Atari officer about design work we were doing. <laughs> And nobody told me I couldn't. Things right. were things were relatively casual in those days. Yeah. But um, uh, but you know everybody was developing their uh, their their kingdoms in those days, and we at the corporate level 
um, began to see the stress fractures within the company pretty clearly as Ray Kassar meddled more and more and more and more, and less was making it actually into production. Less, There was lots of internal innovation within departments, but it wasn't making it outside of those departments. Mm-hmm. You know, Here is the guy who is the chief scientist for Atari who invented the graphical user interface. Right, right. Alan Kay, Chris Jeffers, Brenda Laurel, Aaron Marcus, uh, and the like, and couldn't even talk to the personal computer division about implementing a graphical interface on the Atari 400, 800, 1200 product line. And other things were being done that made sense but were strange. So, for example, um, you know, there's a there was a moment when Bill Gates and Paul Allen had licensed Microsoft Basic to Atari because mm-hmm. we needed a better Basic. Um, mm-hmm. I forget whose flavor we were using originally as the Atari Basic, but it was Shepherdson uh, Microsystems. <sighs> Probably, um, because I wasn't involved in in that, but it was somewhat of an open source mainframe version of Basic that was that was tweaked for Atari specific needs, mm-hmm. and there were a lot of variations. Um, so we decided to go with Microsoft, and the license deal was done, and Bill and Paul delivered their production version, and Atari was supposed to write them a check. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was a large check. If I remember correctly, it was about $5 million. Um, And at that point in time, both both Bill and Paul were not doing well. Um, If I remember correctly, they were actually flat broke. And it was so bad that actually one of the Atari officers had to fly them to New York so they'd get the check cashed. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the great ironies is Atari begat Microsoft. I mean, the comp- uh, you know, Paul and yeah. Bill's company wasn't even called Microsoft at that point in time. It was called uh, Personal Software. Yeah. Microsoft was a product, not mm-hmm. the name of the company. Mm-hmm. But after that point in time with Microsoft Basic, they quickly changed the name of their company uh, to that, threw away, you know, one of the things that most people don't know is that Microsoft was actually one of the first video game publishers. And that one of their most successful products was Microsoft Adventure for the TRS-80. No, I did not know that. Something that... You know, I'm, I'm sure nobody there realizes today, but um, and in fact, uh, prior to their involvement with Atari, they were a, a TRS-80 platform software publisher. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we did a variety of interesting things in corporate research. One of the things that I developed was the first uh, digitizer that was based upon the paddle controllers for the Atari 800, 400, 800. Okay. Um, developed a device that... Digitizing video or audio or, or what? No, being able to digitize the drawing oh, okay. on paper. Mm-hmm. Remember, there were no scanners in those days. Sure. There was no way to take a paper drawing and convert it to a digital form that you could display on the screen mm-hmm. and edit. Um, so it utilized the... Uh, the angular positioning of of two paddles along with a linear um, sensor that you calibrated it and then it counted uh, where the linear position of each of the arms was. So you literally could trace a drawing on a piece of paper and convert that into a digital series of pixels that could could appear on the screen and, in fact, could be edited extremely helpful from a, a game design point of view. So Unfortunately, like, we never... I'm trying to, trying to picture it. So you'd have... You'd, you'd maybe put a put a, a drawing down and then you'd use a stylus or 
arm or something to trace over the drawing that you had on the exactly. paper? Okay. Exactly. Except it used a triangulation method. So you mm -hmm. had um, you had the two angular sensors and linear sensors at the two bottom corners. And you held a, a kind of a stylus or a puck, if you will, mm -hmm. at the head along with a, um, uh, a visual bomb sight. And you just sort of pulled this around to trace the drawing. In those days, there was no such device. Uh, within a couple of years, you had uh, you had a variety of devices, certainly in, up into the late 80s, mm -hmm. uh, from people like AutoCAD. You know, they had right. a, such a device in the late 80s as well. Um, we designed a an optical mouse for the 800. <laughs> we used a slightly different mechanism because um, the the optical mouse that was designed by was his name Bill Lyons at Xerox Park. Mm -hmm. used a mechanical mechanism, which was the original wheels inside the mouse. Mm -hmm. I designed one that used an optical technology that had precision dots that were placed on the mouse ball and was able to use uh, three sensors to detect the movement of those dots across an optical sensor, and it could tell which direction and how fast you were moving. Hmm. That also never made it to production. And yet it would have been an easily manufacturable product. It must have been uh, incredibly frustrating to keep coming out with these awesome things and then have them go absolutely nowhere. Well, that's why I ultimately left the company, uh, yeah. to found a company called Romox and <clears throat> do our own things. Right. Um, one of the other things that I worked on with uh, a couple of the staff in research engineering, we had this incredible mechanical engineer. His name was Notis Panagiotopoulos. He was a Greek. And he was a total wacko character, but then we all were in those days. Um, and Notis's claim to fame was he was the inventor of the douche bottle. Okay. Um and he got royalties for it. So he was hmm. sort of independently wealthy. But he had this incredible mechanical uh, laboratory at 1196 uh, Boregas, which was the corporate research building, right across the street from corporate HQ. And he and I worked on this project. There was a company in the Valley called Drexler Technology who invented rewritable optical media. Okay. What we now know as, you know, read-write CD-ROMs mm -hmm. was invented by these guys. Now, there were optical media that were available. Um, but there were right projects, whatever. You've heard of the Atari Eric project? Uh, I couldn't tell you what it was right now, so probably not. <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was an interactive laser disc kiosk. We were okay. trying to develop interactive video software that was powered by the Atari computers mm -hmm. using uh, pioneer optical disc players, these big VP1000 players. They were a top-loading player. It was like two feet wide and about a foot and a half deep, and it was this big, massive thing that was the first-generation player of for pioneers' uh, Laser discs. Mm -hmm. um, so I I helped with some of the 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 hardware interfacing with that thing, and there was another couple of engineers and another research group. I think it was Cyan that did the the actual interface and the programming for it. Um, I have a question about that. before before we move on. To a quick okay. side note. I talked to someone recently about that device. Uh, did an interview, and he said that it needed to be ready for, I'm looking for verification here, he said it needed to be ready for, he thought it was CES, and it wasn't ready, it was almost ready, but it wasn't quite working, and ultimately, Comdex. they it was a Comdex, and ultimately they hit a guy in a box under the table or something to, to be an interface between the computer, and then he just like hit buttons on the remote control. Can you verify that story? 
Well, as far as I remember, it worked just fine. And I <laughs> still have a couple of the Eric laser discs. Wow. Because now it is possible that things went awry and they had somebody but you see, the way Eric worked was you interacted with it through the keyboard and it fast forwarded to a particular frame on the disc mm-hmm. and then played a video mm-hmm. clip. So there's no physical way that I can imagine that somebody under a table could fast forward it, you know, that could have a cheat sheet of where all these frames were that it would make sense. Hmm. Okay. Now there was there was an Eric one and then there was an Eric two. I think in I in my laserdisc library I have both of those. Wow. <clears throat> I would like to digitize them if uh if I might borrow them from you. Uh you'd need a working laserdisc player. I have a working laser disc player. Just for things wow. like this. <laughs> you're you're one of the three people in the world who still has one. <laughs> right. So what this company had developed was a very interesting technology where they developed this peculiar laminate, optical laminate where the idea was that they had multiple layers and the bottom layer was a dark substrate and then there was this silver crystalline layer that if you if you hit it with a focused laser what it did was it caused the layer to heat up and then the silver would migrate out and sh- allow you to see through to the dark substrate so you had a reflective layer and then you had the dark layer. And then if you hit it with a with a broader unfocused beam, it would cause the silver to migrate back in. And you could rewrite maybe 25 or 30 times. Um before basically it would be just a mess. Mm-hmm. Um so the idea was is that you could coat this on sort of a credit card and primarily use it as a high volume rewritable medium so you could rewrite it comfortably 10 times uh for doing either either doing backups or you could use it for software production purposes which many times you've got to do it a couple of times as bugs are developed etc but primarily um i think the first practical application of it was blue cross blue shield in California in about 1983 was testing it for basic medical data. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem was the the read-write mechanism. Um, They had a test rig, which was a single semiconductor laser, and they could write a dot onto a piece of this medium, but there was no mechanical mechanism. So no piece um, took a trip over to Switzerland for a week, and he he dived into, if I remember correctly, it was Rolex. Mm-hmm. And he went through their watch repair school. And he came back and he built a, a clockwork watch-like mechanism to be the stepper because the problem wasn't that we couldn't move the laser back and forth. Mm-hmm. The problem was is that we couldn't step the card underneath it reliably. So what we had to have was we had to have a way that we could put the card in, align it with an optical alignment point, and then reliably step it in and out from there so that we could read each row of the dots. There was no electrical way of being able to do that. Stepper motors weren't quite reliable enough. Floppy drives, yes, you could do that on one axis, Mm -hmm. um, stepping it in and stepping it out, and then basically the horizontal movement was handled by the spin of the the disc. Um, And floppy drives were notorious for their alignment problems until the five and a quarter drives that we built at Atari were rock solid. But that was our fundamental problem. So he built this clockwork mechanism that was powered by a little servo motor um, that was dead on accurate. 
you know, down to, to a few microns um, along both axes. And we actually had a prototype of this card reader and the ability to have a rewritable optical media in 1981. Hmm. We costed out the production cost on it, and it would have cost about $1,100. Mm-hmm. Um, to manufacture it, meaning it would have been about uh, fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars uh, consumer cost, and the marketplace looked like it was absolutely ready to buy this thing. Um, but once again, we could never get it through the filter of our CEO and his divine wisdom. Hmm. But yet well. they would do ET. <laughs> right. Um, so I think that was the straw that broke my camel's back along with the uh, the Puffer Project, which was the code name for the uh, the Battle Zone Exercise Bicycle. Mm-hmm. Um, too many things that were absolutely oh, and and then there was the then there was the mental game controller that I built. Tell me about it. Where you could control Pong with your mind. Hmm. It actually was a, was a very simple concept. Um, I don't know. At some point, we had, we had uh, a wave of paranoia through the company, and uh, they were giving certain people polygraph tests. Uh, I think it had to do with... Oh, I remember what it was. Um... Do you remember a computer called the Amiga? Sure. You know it was designed in Atari. Yes, it was designed in Atari and, and uh, ultimately ended up at Commodore after a protracted <laughs> mess. <laughs> yes. Well, it was designed in corporate research in, in my building, um, and I was the initial architect and designer for that. Wow. I... Somewhere in my files, I still have the original paper designs of what that computer was going to look like and some of its key components. For example, um, we, we didn't have an optical pointing device. You know, I had designed the mouse and that went nowhere. So when we were thinking about this, what we were thinking about fundamentally was we needed a next-generation platform computer. Mm -hmm. And General Instruments had come up with this brilliant 32-bit processor pair in in 81. Mm -hmm. So we would have gone in one step from the 8-bit 6502s to the GI chip, which was a 32-bit machine, uh, from the one megahertz uh, 6502 to I think mm-hmm. a four megahertz 32-bit processor pair. Hmm. So we wanted several things. One, we wanted to increase the density of the floppy drive. That was actually relatively easy. Um, so we were beginning to look at some architectural models. Uh, we had a chip design for a um, a 16-bit graphic processor mm-hmm. set. Actually, it was two processors. Um, we had a 16-bit sound processor design that we could have rolled out that the semiconductor group had already created the design for. Um, so what we needed was we needed a robust processor, and Ray Kassar vetoed the general instrument because he didn't like them. <laughs> so he opted for a 16-bit design instead of a 32-bit design. Mm-hmm. He almost wanted us to use a Z80 processor because he was convinced that that was going to be the industry standard huh. because it was being implemented in the MSX. Right. Microsoft's one massive failure. Right. Yeah. Um, which Bill Gates never lived down and never forgot. <laughs> um, 
I had I had quite a bit to do with the MSX product line in 1983, um, as I'll explain in a minute. Okay. But so one of the things that was that was revolutionary about the machine that that I was designing um, was, and we were calling it the 1800. Okay. The Amiga was a variation on the code name, and I think it was Amelia. Because all Atari code names were female names. Yes. Stella and Candy and Colleen and so so on. Yeah, except... I broke that mold in our group because we did a lot of things that weren't female, like uh, the the digitizer device was called Victoria, mm-hmm. but the exercise bicycle was called Puffer. Right. Um, there was a chip the, called Freddy later, but that, that could be a female name, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, the, um, and the optical media was called Glamour, if I remember correctly, hmm. because it was mirror-like. Hmm. Anyway, so one of the things that I put on this was the world's first touchpad, like all laptops have now. Mm-hmm. Um, very simple LCD, well, excuse me, very simple um, membrane keypad. Mm-hmm. So the resolution wasn't great. Um, it was a device that was about, I think it was either two and a half inches square or three inches square. And it was laid out like a membrane keypad of the of the era, mm-hmm. uh, probably quarter inch matrix of switches. So you could push it and it would, you know, it was the equivalent of a membrane key. Um, so you could move across it and as you moved across it, the various switches would close. So it would know where you were. Mm -hmm. But then we did something really clever. We put underneath it, because this membrane keypad was transparent, we put an LCD display underneath it. Hmm. So you could not only use it as a touchpad, but you could use it as a programmable keypad. Um, not, Not high resolution, but you could display a letter or a number underneath it. Okay. So it it I think if I remember correctly, it was either nine or twelve um programmable keys you could turn it into. Hmm. Then I did something else. Using the L C D, which had a reasonable refresh rate, we made what we called a um a flea. It was a little optical sensor that was very similar in design to the light pen that Atari had. Okay. That you could put on this thing. It was about maybe five inches, five eighths inches in diameter. Mm-hmm. And what it did was, you know how a light pen basically works, is you have a light in between the frames of the TV video that strobes across the image, row by row mm-hmm. by row. Mm -hmm. And when the light pen sees it, the computer knows where that strobe is on the screen. And that's how you got the alignment between the pen and and the object on the screen, right? Mm -hmm. So we did exactly the same thing. We strobed the LCD when when you were in flea mode so that you could move this flea like a, like a light pen over this, uh, over this touch panel so you could get more precision than your finger would allow. Hmm. Okay. All right. Um, And I think we got it down to 16th of an inch. I think that was the size of the the LCD matrix. Hmm. Wow. Um, We used, instead of um, mechanical switches, um, we used the uh, capacitive switches that were on the LC, uh, the RC Stella. Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically, it was just touch switches for things like the uh, 
the major function keys. Um, we used a standard Atari keyboard, uh, but an expanded keyboard that had a numerical keypad built into it. Because by that point in time, the PC had already come out into the marketplace mm -hmm. in uh, in eighty one. So we were looking at what they had done with the numerical keypad, and it made a great mm -hmm. deal of sense for us. Sure. Plus, by that point in time, somebody had already introduced a numerical keypad as an external device that plugged into one of the uh, the game ports on the front of right. the Atari. Right. Um. Plan was to have. Um, a a dual floppy drive because uh, a year and a half previously we had designed the the Atari 815 which was mm -hmm. a dual floppy drive that never made it into production either. Mm -hmm. Right. You know we had the 810 which was a single drive and then the 815 which was a dual drive. Um, and what most people don't know is that you could have had four 815s in series. Um, we actually designed it so that you could actually uh, sort of volume produce your own floppies. So you could have four of those drives in series mm -hmm. and read from one and copy onto seven other drives. Oh, neat. Yeah. The OS permitted that. You know, what most people don't know is that the Atari DOS, the final version mm -hmm. of that was out there with the with the 1200 um, XL mm -hmm. is actually a part of Windows. The, uh, how how is it a part of Windows? Well, if you have a five and a quarter inch floppy drive, you can read Atari discs. Hmm. One of the little secrets is that um, we asked. Microsoft to do some tweaking for our DOS as we were going to go into the 1400 series. Mm -hmm. um, well, we never used their code, but they used our code. <laughs> wow. So to this day, you can plug a five and a quarter inch floppy drive into an IBM PC and read mm -hmm. an Atari disk. Huh. Wow. Because that original format data is still wired into Windows. Hmm. Crazy. Anyway, um, so those are some of the things that I worked on. I mean, things were were insane. You know, it was a, it was an incredible period of time. You had the keys to the cookie store. Yeah. Um, if I had a party at my home, I would just go over to. Um, to one of the company arcades, and I'd check out a full-scale arcade game. I'd get a truck, pickup truck from facilities, and you know, drive a couple of arcade games home and bring them back on Monday. Um, the company store was one of the extraordinary things that created incredible loyalty for Atari employees, and pretty much any place that there was an Atari facility, there was an Atari company store. Mm -hmm. Um, and I still have some of the original mugs and um, a multitude of, of Atari memorabilia from those days. I still have a clock on my wall that I bought in the company store in '81. Nice. nice. Uh, one of the when laser engraving was introduced uh, mm -hmm. in wood, mm -hmm. Atari had a whole series of things that we sold. I mean, we had people who who it actually credit actually goes to the PR department of Atari because they were buying tchotchkes in such volumes that they decided, hey, let's sell them to our employees too. Let's increase our volume um, and we'll be able to buy in larger quantity and have cheaper prices and whatever surplus or, or extra, we'll just sell to our employees. Hmm. It was a great concept. Thanks. But the politics began to get so extreme that, it, as I said, it you know the personal computer division became toxic, and I left that. And then when things started to become very difficult, even at corporate research, where we just couldn't get things done and, and out into manufacturing, 
Yeah. Um, it was time for me to leave. So myself and the owner of the bike shop chain and one of the founders of National Semiconductor and a fairly insane guy from the Philippines, we founded Romox to invent a better distribution model for software. But in order to do that, we had to become a software publisher as well because we had to have our own. In order to provide proof of concept, we had to have software titles that we could distribute using this mechanism. Sure. So did you guys so, how did you guys have that software created? I designed it all and hired programmers to build it for me. Hmm. Um, we did 96 titles over 300 pro production SKUs. Um, I had a full-time musician. We had license agreements with people like Michael Jackson. Wow. Um, in fact, Michael Jackson uh, spent a couple of days at our facility in Campbell um, to help us with the digitization of things like Beat It. Um, we hired somebody from the music industry to handle the licensing arrangements for that. A guy who took our technology and then applied it to the distribution of sheet music, a, a guy by the name of John Monday. So we did some pretty phenomenal titles um, for the Atari, for, uh, for the two Commodores, for the TI. TI was such a pain in the butt to, to <laughs> write software for. Uh, things like ColecoVision, we did MSX, we did um, the 2600, mm -hmm. and we actually were a very successful software publisher just in our own right for the first year. Um, when we rolled out our, our software distribution system, the kiosks in the retail store with the, with the libraries, um, it's funny, our, our first generation was built upon, the kiosk itself was built upon a Compaq lunchbox computer. Mm -hmm. And we integrated a 5 megabyte hard drive, full, full height 5 and a quarter inch mm -hmm. hard drive into these things, which is where the, the application itself was stored on a floppy drive but the software titles that were the library were stored on the hard drive. Hmm. We developed a um, a housing which contained the edge connector interfaces that allowed the individual cartridge flavors to be to be programmed. Our second generation was the one that had the uh, the erasure capability, and that was based upon an Atari, excuse me, a IBM PC. This is before there was the XT. So we were the first company to develop a hard drive version of the IBM PC. Wow. So didn't Romox, uh, for, I, I seem to recall for, for, for some of their products, maybe it was for the 2600, the gimmick was there were double-ended cartridges, so you get two games for the price of one? No, that wasn't Romox. Okay. Ours, ours was, and we patented it, that they were reprogrammable cartridges. Right. Okay. That if you bought a piece of software, that you would be able to take it to our and in fact that was our that was our Trojan horse mm -hmm. is that all of our software was being sold on the reprogrammable cartridges and we were seeding the market. Mm -hmm. um, our production facility was in the Philippines, um, where the cartridges were actually being made, and we were getting them produced at relatively low cost for that era. Uh, reprogrammable cartridge for us was about ten bucks which we would sell for about, well, here goes back to the pricing theory. Yeah. Game prices have stayed the same for 35 years. <laughs> they sold for about $50 in those days, and they sell mm -hmm. for about $50 now. Mm -hmm. um, but um, as a matter of fact, on my shelf, I have um, about 25 of the Romox packages. Thanks. Let's see, for the Atari 8-bits, I see there's about 12 packages, uh, 12 cartridges, rather. And uh, we, actually, we actually had 100 titles, 96 titles. Mm -hmm. And probably 80 of those were developed for the Atari. Many of them were also for the Commodore 64, some for the VIC. 
Uh, we had about eight for the TI. We had about eight for the 2600. The Atari 800 was our platform. Hmm. Because because you knew it? Because it was the most interesting because it was the best of the bu- It was the best from both a programmatic point of view mm-hmm. and also from a visual point of view, from a game experience point of view. Mm-hmm. And also, it didn't hurt that I did 100% of the design work on an Atari 800. Right. <laughs> um, and we actually had one of our titles became a top 10 title, a game called Topper, which was essentially a ripoff of Hubert, but it was better than Hubert. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, and we also had a game for our for our network, which... See, one of the things that I was also doing was I was acquiring titles from other people who had floppy-based um, games mm-hmm. and converting them to cartridge-based games. Not a okay. trivial thing. Right. One of the ones that was, uh, that was great was a, was a... What was... Oh, it was called Dancing Feet, F-E-A-T-S. From a company, yes, uh, yes, I know the game. I'm sorry, I know you, uh, but sorry, the again. the owners of the company, the name of the company was Soft Sync, and the owner of the company was uh, Ken and Sue Courier. Ironically, um, I hired Ken and Sue Courier to work with me at Block Publishing, which became ultimately Tiger Direct. Hmm. Um, and we acquired SoftSync as a subsidiary of Block Publishing as well. This was uh, about 1990, 91. So, um, so Romox was doing great. We'd done our proof of concept. We were rolling out, and everything was wonderful and we were going out for our for our second round of funding and Ray Kassar killed Atari. Yeah. He murdered it. Yep. When Atari collapsed and it collapsed very quickly because that 400 million that was in the distribution channel came back at Atari like a rubber band that had been pulled practically to the breaking point. So in a six-month period of time, the entire industry essentially collapsed. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is, you know, uh, mid-83. So 90% of the software developers vanished in about a three- to four-month period of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we put Toys R Us into uh, either bankruptcy or near bankruptcy. We nearly destroyed Sears. Or not we, but I mean Atari nearly destroyed Sears. Mm-hmm. Um, it collapsed the whole entire channel because not only was their product in the channel, but the but the you know the the accounts receivable was hundreds of millions of dollars that these various retailers owed Atari. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife at the time worked at Atari facilities and. She was laid off when the collapse came, and then she was rehired to help because facilities was winding down the company and liquidating. Hmm. It was a very weird situation when you go from 17,000 employees uh, to hundreds of employees that are effectively dismantling the company. Right. So the problem that Romox had was it no longer could have uh, gain access to capital. Mm-hmm. Nobody was willing to invest in that marketplace anymore. Um, so we ended up taking our technology and selling it to a Japanese consortium because MSX had some life. It looked like it was going to be the next thing. Right. Little did they know. <laughs> they were just plain stupid. So I spent about a year in Japan from uh, mid-83 to about mid-80, well, early 84, working with the the MSX consortium companies and our Japanese partner 
um, because the Japanese got the concept of the necessity of a distribution method for their cartridge software for the MSX products because the majority of the software was cartridge-based. So we developed reprogrammable cartridges for the MSX cartridges and also for the, what well, I personally did, uh, for the Nintendo family computer, the red and white Ninten- mm-hmm. first-generation Nintendo box. Right, the Famicom, right? Yep, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, nice little nice little device. I mean, great graphics, great gameplay. Um, if Atari had had any sense, they would have acquired Nintendo at that point in time, which they could have done for a few million. Right. But then again, the, the sock maker had no freaking clue. <laughs> I have no respect for the man hmm. um, because he helped he helped kill the first great technology company. Anyway, um, so I interacted quite extensively with a bunch of Japanese companies. Um, personally, had quite a bit of interaction with the founder and CEO of Sony, mm-hmm. um, Mr. Morita. And his son, who was his son, was the pioneer between behind Sony's uh, Hitbit MSX machines, mm-hmm. and of course Matsushita, Panasonic, and and the others, Hitachi. Ironically, one of the things that most people don't know was Hitachi invented the laptop computer, mm-hmm. and it was an MSX product. Um, oh. It was a little computer, it was an MSX machine that had an LCD display built into it, and it had a, ha- you know, a, a, a retractable handle. Mm-hmm. Um, very cool machine. The, the compact was certainly portable, but it wasn't a laptop by any manner of means. The damn thing weighed 50 pounds. You've got a hernia carrying that puppy around. But it was a really good game machine, particularly playing Microsoft Decathlon <laughs> on its green screen. Mm-hmm. And and um, the Microsoft uh, Flight Simulator. After I came back from Japan, I ended up spending um, a bit of time uh, consulting with Androbot, another one of uh, Nolan Bushnell's company. Mm-hmm. Um, and also talking to the Tremils. Um Sam was pretty rational. His brother was insane, and the old man was just an asshole. <laughs> um, God, I'm trying to remember the, the guy who was the actual head of their engineering department. Fabulously great guy. Mm-hmm. Um, they wanted to hire me, but... I was more interested in robots, and then when that didn't really go anywhere, because I realized pretty quickly that Androbot was not ready for prime time, mm-hmm. they were not going to be able to solve their problems. Mm-hmm. I ended up going to uh, to uh, transfer the rest of the Romox technology to a company in the UK for about a year and a half. Mm-hmm. When I came back from there, uh, we founded uh, Block Development Company, Block Development Corp which has a rather interesting distinction. Now, not only did it become Tiger Direct, but it has the longest-lived piece of software in the history of software. What is that? It's still published to this day. Hmm. Um, It was introduced in 85. 30 years later, it's still being published. It's a product called Form Tool. It went through several hands, mm-hmm. but very interesting application in that um, it was the world's first form design product. Today, you design forms in Excel or Word or Microsoft Publisher and mm-hmm. do just a great job. But uh, in those days, there was no such animal, and we invented that along with a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, Block Development uh, was a software publishing company, and over a six-year period of time, I created about 22 large-scale, number one-selling software products. Hmm. 
we were dominant on the uh, the soft sell um, top twenty chart for about six years. Well, wow. along with such companies as Ashton Tate and IBM and all the rest. So what were some of your your big sellers? FormTool was our number one seller, and in fact, mm-hmm. that was a number one product, and it stayed in the top ten for about four years. I published the first memory resident software management tool because um, in 87, people figured out how to put additional programs resident in in DOS. Sure. But like you can get rid of, of them. Right. Huh? Like TSR programs? Yeah, but you couldn't get rid of them. So we invented a product called PopTrop that allowed you allowed you to remove them and remove the hooks in the OS so that um, you didn't crash the computer or have to restart it. Hmm. Um, we published a product called PageGarden, which was the first real desktop publishing product from the author of VisiCalc. In fact, most people don't know this, but the first major platform for spreadsheets was Mm -hmm. the Atari home computer because it was published for CPM and the Atari at the same time. Hmm. I still have a copy of VisiCalc for the Atari, and I have a copy (laughs) for the PC, and it still runs on a PC. Wow. Pretty primitive, but it still runs. That early DOS stuff still works. Um, I was with uh, Block Development, which became Tiger Direct in 1981, and I quit then. Went off and did some uh, graphic design software. Mm-hmm. Uh, came back to it, came back to Tiger in uh, beginning of '94. Stayed there till '98. Uh, did a whole bunch of publishing and mass market uh, catalog kind of stuff. Uh, put the company up onto the internet in 1994, had an actual e-commerce platform running in 95. Uh, one of the things that most people don't know was that Romox invented the shopping cart in 1982 for wow. our kiosk-based system. We also invented the world's first online advertising also on that kiosk system. Wow. Using a model not so dissimilar from the way the web works now. We had a server, we had a server, and we had, in effect, browsers Mm -hmm. on the individual terminals. And we pushed uh, advertising content and marketing content from the server down to those individual machines. Our clients, like 7-Eleven, could call us in the morning and say, hey, we want to have a special on Slurpees that afternoon. And we would actually have graphical ads that would appear on those terminals in their stores by that afternoon. Wow. Well, this is great. Um, we've wandered far out of Atari <laughs> land. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so that's that's a bunch of the Atari. Um, if you know, there's anything else that occurs to you, feel free to give me a call back. I will. I uh, appreciate your time. I, you have had so many interesting stories, and, and I love hearing about the products that didn't uh, quite make it. And I appreciate that. Thank you. I mean, there were, there were a lot of them. Um, you know, you've got people like Chris Crawford, um, who were head of, of gaming research at, mm-hmm. at Atari, mm-hmm. who was developing some incredibly sophisticated uh, logic engines and and uh, graphical display engines for some fairly incredible games. I haven't talked to him in a million years. Uh, he was he was not an individual that was terribly approachable mm-hmm. in the Atari days. Mm-hmm. I was more of the uh, pistol on my hip kind of guy in those days. Chris was locked in a room and didn't want to talk to anybody. Right. But then again, he was working at a level that was pretty high up there. 
Yeah. Um, one of the the Atari research people that came over with Alan Kay was Aaron Marcus. And this is a guy who absolutely gets no credit, but he was revolutionary and extremely pivotal in helping Alan and Chris develop um, the Dynabook concept that ultimately, you know, when, when Alan and his guys went over uh, to Apple, um, you know, Steve Jobs plagiarized Xerox Park incredibly mm-hmm. in the development right. of the Mac. Uh, and then had the good fortune to decide that he should hire Alan to actually sort of polish it off. He hired Alan primarily to work on the next project, and then, of course, uh, became Alan became chief scientist uh, of, of Apple. Um, but Aaron Marcus is definitely a guy that got very, very little credit, and primarily, I think, because after the uh, the Xerox Park debacle and then Atari. Uh, he decided to go as an independent consultant. I hired him to help me with um, a graphical user interface form, professional form design and management system that we were developing at Block Development mm-hmm. uh, in about '88, if I remember correctly. Um, sort of stayed connected with him, um, Largely, when I left California in 85, even though I was living in Japan and Scotland, I still maintained my residence, and my wife remained in in California. Mm -hmm. Uh, When I left California in 85 to move here to Miami, uh, completely lost touch with pretty much everybody. Mm. A bit like giving up your citizenship. Yeah. So as I said, if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to let me know. Great. Thank you so very much for your time. I appreciate it. Take care. If you enjoyed these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org donate.